Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here with you this morning. Um, if you've been tracking over the last few weeks, you'll know that we've just come out of a series in the book of Ezra. And it was such an exceptional series. And really just to commend Pastor Richard for the way that I think he just uh, sensitively handled God's word and, and really brought, I think, just a, a message that was so timely for the season that we're in. And we kind of at the end of this series as a pastoral team just, just sat, sat down and thought, hey, what do we, what do we want to do next? And, and for those of you who have played sport or who, who play sport currently, you'll know how important a good halftime talk is. A good halftime talk has the potential to revitalize and energize a team. A good halftime talk has the ability to get a team to think about the basics and the game plan. A good halftime talk has the potential to change the trajectory of a game. And so over the next three weeks, three of the pastors here at Rosebank want to have a little bit of a halftime talk with you. A couple of months ago, um, Richard spoke about the topic of lament. I don't know about you, but, but I found that sermon particularly refreshing. It was almost as though he was giving us permission again to, to grieve all that we've lost in this season. If I could just let you into the, the things that, that I think I've been longing for, just as we think about normal life, because whenever there's grief, there's a sense of longing for what was. There have been times over lockdown where, where I have just longed to, to see my friends again, longed to see my colleagues face to face instead of over a screen. There have been times when, when I've longed just to get out of the city and sit on a mountain or, or stand on the edge of a trout dam with my fly rod and a, a cup of coffee. And as much as I, I love my children, there have been times where I have just longed for them to go back to school. And I'm sure this morning you feel the same. Some of us have lost so much in this season, some more than others. And there's a longing for it just to go back to the way that it was. Well, this morning I want to introduce you to a man who found himself in the middle of a crisis, who had also lost a huge amount, and who as a result had some deep longings in his heart. The, the son of Korah that we're going to hear about today was a songwriter. We don't know much about him, but we know that in Psalm 84, he wrote down the, some of the longings in his heart in one of the most famous Psalms of all time. So I'd love for us this morning to read Psalm 84 together. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, they are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Barca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty, listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, Blessed is the one who trusts in you. Now, this psalm is built around three blessings or beatitudes. 
And each of the three stanzas in the psalm explains each of these blessings. So let's have a look at the first blessing in verse 4. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. We don't know much from the psalm about what has happened to this son of Korah, but we do know that he is far away from home. Commentators say that perhaps he, along with, with some of the Israelites, have been um, exiled into Babylon. And so he's also in lockdown in a sense, not in lockdown at home, but in lockdown away from home in a faraway land. It's clear from the psalm, though, that this is a man who is missing home, who longs to be home. But what is it about home that he's missing? Mom's roast chicken, Netflix on the couch? Not exactly. Let's have a look at verses 1 to 3 to get an idea. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty, my soul yearns, even faint, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God. What is he missing? He's missing the courts of the Lord. He's missing going to the temple to worship God. And if you read the Old Testament, you'll know that the temple courts were grand. So grand, in fact, that the, the swallows and the sparrows had found a nest in the rafters. Close to the altar, this beautiful altar. And, and you can just imagine the son of Korah thinking about the altar and thinking about the priests and the Levites who are making sacrifices there. The son of Korah is longing to be at church again. But is it the building that he's longing for? No, because verse 2 tells us that his heart and his flesh cry out for, long for the living God. Conrad Mbewe says that it is not so much the physical structure that he admires, but the spiritual activity taking place there. It wasn't about the building because church is not the building. This man's joy came from meeting with his God. God was the true object of his longing, and, and he was even jealous of the birds who got to be close to this altar, this altar that represented the very thing that gave him access to this God, where, where God's mercy and compassion are displayed. This son of Korah longs to be at church again, where he can taste the intimacy that being there brings. One of the other things that I have longed for in this season has been getting into the car with my family, driving into the gates of Rosebank Union Church into a packed parking lot, finding a parking space, getting out of the car and taking the hands of my two girls and walking all the way up to KBS, signing them in, and then walking down the stairs through the amphitheater, through those big wooden doors, into the street cafe with the smell of coffee. The place is buzzing. I get to say hi to friends. And then my wife and I walk into the sanctuary, down that slight decline towards the front of the stage. It's a full house. We find a seat right in the front, quieting ourselves to prepare our hearts for worship. And then the band comes out and together with the rest of the church, we begin singing. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. And then whoever's preaching opens up God's word. And God speaks directly to 
me. And my heart is full. And then we have communion and I, I come face to face again with my brokenness and sin, but I'm reminded afresh of God's glorious grace in Jesus Christ. You see, there is a blessing available only found when God's people gather together for corporate worship. But this blessing of experiencing the presence of God in this way is only available to those who long for it, who have the same kind of longing that we see this son of Korah has. So can I ask you this morning, do you have that longing? Do you have that longing to go to church again, to worship corporately with God's people? Not so that you can see the cool building that we have here at Rosebank, but so that you can encounter God, so that you can sit under the preaching of the word, so that you can worship, so that you can meet with him. Do you long for God in this way? Or is coming to church just something you do? You know, you... you you watch the service, but you, you don't engage with your heart. You don't, you don't come expectantly longing for God to speak to you. You know, as, as fantastic as our online services have been, they, they're just not the same as getting together physically to worship, right? But if church isn't the building, then surely God can still meet with his people who, even if it is virtually, are gathered all over the city to worship. We should be having the same attitude in coming to church on a Sunday virtually than we do coming to church physically. So I want to ask us this morning, what kind of attitude do you have to these virtual services? I may be speaking to the wrong crowd because obviously you're tuned in, but it's just been interesting to see how the numbers have slowly dropped, how fewer and fewer people seem to be engaging with church just because it's virtually. I, I don't know if it's because maybe they think it's not the same. How some people start watching the service and then switch off maybe halfway through. If we truly long for God on a Sunday as we gather corporately to worship, we should come expectantly. Not with one eye on the screen and one hand, we're busy, you know, kind of scrolling through Facebook. We should come hungry to hear from God and to worship Him. So in summary, the first blessing, the one who longs for God's presence corporately can expect the blessing of encountering Him in an intimate way. The second blessing is found in verse 5. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. In this second stanza of the psalm, after the son of Korah has been longing to go home again, we, we now see him begin, beginning to, to think about the journey home. You know, just imagine myself and my f fellow Israelites could just leave this place we're in exile and, and just start to come home. Listen to what he says in verse 6. As they pass through the valley of Barca, as they're on this journey, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Again, we don't know the context. We don't know the context of the journey, but what we do know is that this journey is through a dry and weary land. Baca, the valley of Baca, we don't know where that is, but Baca refers to balsam trees, trees that only grow in the driest of places. This is a place where there is no water, and yet what we see is as these pilgrims journey, they make this desert place a place of springs. There's, there's this water that starts to flow up in them and starts to gush out of them. And, and these springs and these pools start to form in this 
desert place. What does this mean? Well, it's a metaphor for how being away from home and, and even just journeying home brings with it some real life difficulties. It's, it's like he's saying, until we get back home, life is hard and filled with trials. And yet what we see is that in the midst of the trials, this water begins to gush out of them. This water that is symbolic of a strength. This water that, that symbolizes spiritual stamina and endurance. But not just endurance because they don't just survive in the desert place. They thrive because verse 7 tells us that they go from strength to strength. They're getting stronger and stronger as they face the trials of life while they're away from home. But more than that, as this strength flows out of them and forms pools, other people are able to benefit from the strength. They are able to enjoy the springs in the desert place. In September last year, my father-in-law, Russell, was rushed to Four Ways Life Hospital. You see, he had a, a wound on his foot that, that went septic. And he went into septic shock, and, and because he's a diabetic, we knew that this was serious. When he was in hospital, he picked up a superbug, which is um, a bug that is resistant to antibiotics. So, and so no, no matter what the doctors were giving him, his body just wasn't responding. The infection just wasn't responding. Eventually, this infection spread from his foot up his leg and to his knee. He had to be moved to Olivedale where he could have a knee replacement so that they could clear out the infection there. And I remember him lying in that bed after that knee op and just having these knee dislocations and just constant agony. We thought Russell would be home maybe, you know, in a few weeks or a month, but he, he ended up staying over Christmas and we had our first Christmas without him. Russell spent a total of seven months in hospital. He had to endure eight surgeries. There was a time when the family went to the hospital to say goodbye to him because he was so weak and so sick. And the family was asking questions during that time. Why? Why does this man have to suffer this way? The pain, the hours in the hospital bed. What are you doing, God? Russell, by God's grace, is out of hospital today, right before lockdown, in fact, he came out. And while he's still walking on, on crutches, he's mending. And we thank God. And the other day I had a conversation with Russell and, and in that conversation, I, I think I, I finally began to understand a little bit of maybe the, you know, the reason why God allowed him to experience um, all of this suffering. You see, as I was chatting to Russell, it became clear to me that God was developing in this man through the trials an inner strength and an, an ability to endure. But more than that, God was using these trials for Russell to be a source of encouragement to others, to make this desert place a place of springs. Russell tells me that when he was in hospital, he would start to give Bible verses to the nursing staff. And eventually word kind of spread and all the nurses and some of the cleaning staff too, would start to come to Russell's bed for their own Bible verse each day. While he was in a step-down facility, he met three men who had been involved in a horrible car accident, paralyzed from the waist down, with, without hope. They were so bleak about their future. It was a time when Russell was probably at his weakest and sickest, but you know what he decided to do to encourage these three men? He decided to teach them to play chess. And they'd play chess together every few days. Russell tells me that some of the visitors who came to uh, visit him during this time shared with him how his um, ability to never complain, his optimism and his faith had a significant impact on their lives. 
even in his greatest season of suffering, this is a man who had living water flowing out of him, giving him strength for the trials and flowing out of him to give strength to others around him. But how does someone like Russell or, or how do these pilgrims that we read about in Psalm 84 get this living water, this strength, this ability to endure the hardest circumstances in life? The Psalm gives us two clues. Firstly, they have a longing for God's presence daily. Look at verse five again. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, not was in you or will be in you when we go back to church, is in you. You see, it's clear that even those, though these people have been far away from home and have not been able to go to the temple to meet with God and worship him, they have a relationship with him daily. A relationship, a relationship that sustains them now. The text doesn't say that they only have strength when they go to church from Sunday to Sunday. It implies an ongoing strength. As important as temple worship was, they don't rely only on that. They don't make excuses to not be devoted to God despite daily trials. They have a longing for God's presence today. Did you know that every single day while Russell was in hospital, his wife Louise would sit next to his bed and they would long for God right there. She would open up the Bible, read to him, and then Russell would spend the hours and hours that he had lying on his bed, meditating on God's word and praying. No wonder he had this internal strength. The second clue from the psalm shows us how important it is to have a longing for God's presence in eternity. Look at verse 5 again. They had hearts set on pilgrimage. These people didn't just linger on their circumstances. They fixed their eyes on the prize, on coming home. And, and it goes deeper than just coming home to Israel because in verse 7 it tells us that they look forward to meeting God in their heavenly home in Zion. Why? Be because they long to be in God's presence for all of eternity and they know that nothing that comes their way in this lifetime can thwart God's plans to give them an eternity with him and they will be in his presence for all of their days and they long for that. And so they're able to endure. So again, do you have a longing for God today? A longing that shows itself in a relationship of devotion. We actually just spend time with him. Where you enjoy him. And as a result, you're able to face things like coronaviruses and losing jobs and, and all the other difficult things that a season like this brings. But more than that, because of this strength in you, water flows up out of you and others are able to be blessed in their trials as a result of your relationship with God. And lastly, do you have a longing for God's presence in eternity? Or have you become a little bit blind to that and so focused on your circumstances now? So to summarize again, second blessing. The one who longs for God's presence daily and who walks with God daily and who longs for God's presence in eternity can expect to have a strength flowing in and through him until the day comes when he can go home. And that is Siri talking to me right now while I'm preaching. The third blessing. Blessed is the one who trusts in you. Have a look at verse 12. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. From verse 8 in the psalm, we begin to see that this son of Korah doesn't only long for and worship God, but but he also trusts him implicitly. 
In verse 8, this son of Korah turns to God in prayer and he says, Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. This son of God, the son of Korah is trusting God for protection. This word shield is a defensive term. It's a, a piece of armor. And you see this imagery again in verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. So this man trusts God and he trusts him for protection. Why does he need protection? Well, in verse 10, he says, Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. This man longs to be home and away from the wicked. He says he would rather be on gate duty at church than be anywhere near where the wicked are. Perhaps as he pens the psalm, he's in a place like Babylon and he, and he looks around, the, around him and there's pagan worship and there's wickedness and it, it's just, it, it bothers him and it makes him sick in his stomach. And he, and he doesn't want any of it to influence him and he just longs to get out of this broken place, this wicked place and just to go home to be near God. In Psalm 73, Asaph seems to be dealing with, with something similar. And I think he helps us understand maybe something of what the son of Korah would have been feeling. So I'm just going to read a few verses from Psalm 73, just to get a sense of what it feels like to just have the wicked around you and to be sick of it. In verse 7, Asaph says, From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice, with arrogance. They threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. Isn't it amazing that here we see the wicked drinking from the wicked? They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? Do you sometimes feel like this as you maybe just look around you at the world? Maybe you're on, on the news or, or on you know, Facebook or whatever and, and you just read stories and see videos and posts of just wickedness. You, you, you see things like racism, gender-based violence, hatred, sexual immorality, idolatry, and it just bothers you it just makes you sick in the stomach and you just long for God to protect you from its influence you long to be home with him where where none of this will exist this is what the son of Korah feels about the wickedness around him and he's trusting God to protect him from it and to bring him home but what is this son of Korah's guarantee that God will indeed do this? Look at what he says in verse 9. God, look on our shield. Look with favor on your anointed one. On a representative. On someone that you highly favor. Who is this anointed one? That he's talking about. Well, it's their king. It's the king of Israel at the time. And while they're away from home in the presence of the wicked, God will protect them because of who their king is. Our world is in turmoil. The, the virus has ravaged it. And on top of that, the effects of sin are just plain to see. We're saddened by the things that we, that we see in, in the world and in our own country. We, we read about things like corruption and we just, we're horrified. It feels like we're just aliens in this place. Like we're in exile away from home and are longing to be 
in the courts of the Lord again, away from the tents of the wicked. But we too have a guarantee that God will protect us while we're away from home and that he will bring us home again. Because we too have a king, an anointed one, one who God looks on with favor. King Jesus is our guarantee because on the cross he did defeat wickedness and sin. And he did promise to those who are in him that he will get us home one day. If your confidence is in what Jesus did on the cross, you can be sure that a day will come when God will utterly destroy all that is wicked. A day will come where he will restore all that is broken. Where, where he will hold all of those who have done wicked things accountable where he will wipe away the tears from every eye because of what King Jesus did at the cross and because he was raised to life again. So this morning, if you trust in King Jesus in this lifetime, as hard as it is to sometimes just be a follower of Jesus in this world, you can know that if you walk with God daily, he'll give you strength to endure. But also that if you trust him, if you put your confidence in the representative who is Jesus, he will keep you from the influence of this wicked until the day you get home where he preserves for himself those who have loved him and trusted him. As I close, I want to encourage you this morning, whatever space you're in, King Jesus is not in captivity. He's alive. He's working. Whether you and I feel it or not. And he's using all that is happening in our world at the moment to accomplish his great purposes in your life and for his glory. Hold on to him. Walk with him. Pursue him. Trust him. He will give you strength while we journey home together and he'll keep us safe. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for what we read about in Psalm 84. We just are sorry for the ways that we don't long for you enough. And we, we pray that you would stir in our hearts a, a longing God to to worship you corporately again. That you would give us a longing in our hearts to experience your presence there. God, but also that you'd give us a longing in our hearts to experience your presence daily. So much so that as we experience the trials of life, God, we, we can know that you'll give us strength because you're with us. And God, that you'd give us eternal perspective as we look to the future as we look to heaven. Help us as we pilgrim through this world, Lord, to make the desert a place of springs so that others around us, who, who are, those who know you and those who don't, can be pointed to you, Jesus. Thank you that we can trust, that we have a guarantee, that we have a king who, because of what he did on the cross, defeated Satan and sin and, and all that is wicked. And that he will keep us from that wickedness until the day that we can meet together with him in heaven. And we thank you, Jesus, for the promise that you will make all things right. Pray for the people who are watching today, Lord, to experience you this week. Where it maybe has felt like a, a desert in their, in their intimacy with you, in their walk with you, God, that you would come and you would just bring water again. Touch your people revitalize them in this little halftime talk so that they can get back into the game refreshed. In Jesus' name, amen.